maybe are used to it from previous flood fights. What we try to get out to the public is what's going on, what we're <coughs> anticipating coming in the future, how we're going to prepare for it, and what we're going to do. A lot of things have changed since uh, 2009, so I'm going to try to have our different uh, members explain to you what's, what's happened and what's going on and what you might expect different in this flood fight. And as always, a lot of times people get concerned about how you're starting off early. Uh, Bruce and I can remember one year we started sandbagging on Valentine's Day. He was very unpopular in a lot of households. But uh, this uh, is a late spring flood for us, but we have to be ready. It's not a question of uh, are, are you having enough sandbags, you still have to deploy them, so you need time to do both things. So we'd rather have everything ready to go as we need to go than to say, whoops, we gotta get moving real fast. So what we're gonna do first, and I'd like the different people on this table to introduce themselves, give you a little bit of idea what their role in this flood fight is, and, uh, and give you an idea what, what our team is. So Bruce Grubb. Bruce Grubb, I'm Fargo City Administrator, and the mayor has incident commander for this spring flood fight, so thank you for being here. Hi, good morning, I'm Michael Redlinger, I'm the Assistant City Administrator, and I'll be assisting Bruce as the uh, Assistant IC. Uh, good morning, I'm Nathan Borboom from the Engineering Department, uh, leading the charge with a bunch of others in engineering on where we should be constructing all emergency levies. Nicole Crutchfield, Planning Director, and my role during the flood is uh, logistics. Uh, ben Dow, Public Works. Um, we work heavily with our infrastructure, uh, sanitary sewers, storm sewers, along with uh, sandbag placement and work very closely with our engineering department. Jerry Ludlam, uh, City of Fargo Solid Waste Utility uh, Director, and this time of year then I take over operations at Sandbag Central. Steve Dirksen, Fire Chief. Uh, we're putting folks at Sandbag Central and be part of the deployment of sandbags out in the community and still responding to things day to day in the city as well. Ross Fenner, Deputy Chief of Police. Uh, we're responsible for uh, general safety and security and traffic routes in those areas that we'll be deploying sandbags. Good morning, I'm Beth Slutty and I'm the Superintendent for West Fargo Public Schools and our students will be assisting with the flood fight. Rupa Gandhi, Superintendent for Fargo Public Schools. Um, our students will be assisting with the flood fight, helping with infrastructure or whatever else the city needs. Craig Whitney with the Chamber, and we're looking forward to doing everything we can flood fight. Dean Bershani from North Dakota State University, uh, head of the 15,000 person stand up uh, backup workforce. <laughs> Joel Vettel, uh, Fargo Park District. Uh, we're, our role will, it really is to assist the city in any way we can to help make sure that things go well. Colonel Darren Anderson, 119th Wing Commander, uh, to be called out whenever my boss needs me. All right, and that's me, uh, Al Dorman. I'm the Adjutant General and Director of Emergency Services for the state. Uh, we got some other teammates here from the Army and the Air National Guard and Cody Schultz from Homeland Security. Just want to get on the ground, get the relationship built uh, so that we're ready to go if you need us. <coughs> Jason Benson, Cass County Engineer. For the flood fight, I'm the incident commander for the county for all those areas outside of the city limits. Good morning, Robert Wilson. I'm the Cass County Administrator, and for our flood fight, I'm a PIO. Jesse Johnner, Cass County Sheriff, and uh, of course, public safety out in the county and assistance in the city if they need it, and also uh, we'll have uh, rescue operations available. Uh, good morning, Mary Sherling. I'm the chair of the Cass County Commission. Good morning, John Strand, Fargo City Commission. Dave Pepcorn, Fargo City Commission. Yeah, this is a flood fight in Fargo and the county, so uh, Mary Sherling, if you want to make a comment for the county opening remark, I'd appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, good morning, everyone. Yes, uh, we declared a state of emergency last, last week along with um, many of our other uh, local jurisdictions. We anticipate that <clears throat> You know, if, if uh, we do get significant flooding on the, on the red, we will also have overland flooding out in, in rural areas. To that end, uh, Sheriff Johnner has been canvassing those rural uh, homes, especially uh, along the river, to, uh, to assess what those needs might be should they occur. Uh, this week, we are going to start our sandbagging operations, and, and I will let Mr. Wilson uh, talk about that a, a little more detail later. But uh, today we're going to kick off some rural meetings, um, 7 o'clock tonight in Hickson, 
at the community center tomorrow at Bennett Elementary uh, in, in Fargo, uh, in, and that will be um, for, for re rural residents that are south of 94 to County 14 um, tonight, and then County 14 uh, south to the Richland County line, um, <coughs> excuse me, will be tonight, and then tomorrow, uh, or Wednesday evening, Harwood, uh, for everything north of of the community so um, but anybody can go to any of those any of those community meetings we also have a, a great website if you go to uh, cascountynd.gov there's a really neat interactive uh, tool that you can put the address of your home in and dial up and down to see where the river level is and, and see when it starts to hit your hit your house so that can be very informative especially for people that have never um, never gone through one of these events before. So, uh, thank you. Well, Mr. Grubb, you want to start this out? Uh, sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, after 2013, that was the last spring flood fight that uh, we faced. We, we all kind of hoped, myself personally, that we'd never have to do this again. But um, through that time, since 2013, we haven't figured out how to control the weather yet, so here we all are again. But um, I wanted to point out a week ago, we conducted a tabletop training exercise out at our emergency operations center. Um, and that was to try to get reacquainted with spring flood fighting. Uh, I think it turned out to be uh, extremely valuable because we've lost uh, a lot of institutional flood fighting knowledge since 2013, but uh, for both the city and the county, we've got new faces and leadership positions, and I think the good news in all that is uh, we both still got really deep benches, and so I'm extremely thankful for that. The, uh, in our tr tabletop training exercise, the probabilistic uh, flood forecast that was put out by the National Weather Service on March 15th is what we use to develop our flood fighting strategy. Uh, if you look at what those probabilistic numbers are, they really get your attention. Uh, based on the percentage of probability of occurrence, just as example, the 5% number, which is the number the 2009 flood hit, would be a new flood of record in Fargo. And so we, we've got to be uh, uh, very cognizant of that. Um, for example, what makes flood fighting so difficult in uh, 2009, I believe we started out with a flood fighting strategy centered on the 50% probability the river crested at the 5%. And so after 2009, we kind of selected the 10% is what we'll prepare for. You don't necessarily have to build everything to that 10%, but get prepared for it. Well. In 2013, that's what we did. We built a flood fighting strategy around the 10%, and I think the river crested at about the 50%. So it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to predict. Uh, we decided this year to stick with that 10% strategy because of the current probabilistic forecast. And um, we've asked uh, Greg Gus, kind enough with National Weather Service to be here today, and, and it would really be helpful, I think, if he could speak to that a little bit. And uh, the last time I heard him talk about this forecast, he, he spoke a little bit about the inputs that go into their model that I found really interesting. And so, Greg, <coughs> could you help us out today? Will do. So the first thing I want to point out on here, let's see. have to get there we go so most of us in this room know which direction the river flows right so we are coming in pretty much from the south to north on the red river but obviously the tributaries are flowing in from the east side and from the west side into there and I just point out if you can tell where Fargo is the FGO on there below that the brown and the green territory that's the drainage area that is coming into Fargo so you got some several thousand square miles of drainage that are moving in. And I point that out that, that typically in Fargo, the streets are bare, the ground is uh, open, the snow has run off. Well, that doesn't mean the flood is over. Where's the water coming from? So I just bring that up to point out that you've got a lot of territory that has to drain 
through, through here on its way north. And of course, where does it thaw first? It typically thaws first on the south and southeastern band, so, so across that south end of the brown and the green, and maybe even up the, uh, the right-hand side there up in the Minnesota treed area where it starts to thaw, and then from that bench land, that water is moving down onto the flats, which are still largely frozen. The river is still frozen in place, so you have water moving into that territory. So again, that's the type of thing we're going to see. And of course, that's off our web page, and that's all the gauges. The green are the forecast locations, those green dots on there, and then all those blue triangles are other gauges along those tributaries. And if we were to actually, if that was live and I clicked on there, you would see down in uh, Grant County, Elbow Lake, you'd see in Traverse County, you'd see in Southern Wilkin County, where things are starting to move. So there's water that is melting in the last, this past week that is moving into some of those streams and rivers that are starting to rise. And of course, the talk of the town has been over the weekend that here at uh, the Red River at Wapton Breckenridge is starting to rise and there's a forecast out there. Well, most of that water that's moving up into that is actually releases from Otter Tail, or excuse me, from the Orwell Dam <coughs> on the Otter Tail River and from Lake Travers coming in on the Bois de Sioux. So most of that is water that is coming out of those reservoirs to make room for flood water that will be coming in. Okay, so that's water that is breaking up or starting to work on the ice that's in the channel and start to get things moving. And that water will progress up the river and into the red here in Fargo, and you'll see water and, and ice starting to rise and starting to flex over time. But important to that is temperatures. So right now we're chilly this morning. We cooled down quite a bit last night. We're chilly today and tomorrow. And then we're going to start warming as we go into this week. And by the middle to latter part of the week, that's a, a middle of the night, if you will, Thursday night, um, where those are heating degree hours. So whereas that area of Fergus falls down to Elbow Lake, Elbow Lake, we're pushing up 35, 30, 40, some areas at the headwaters pushing 50 or 60 hours. We have to get 60 to 100 hours. So when we get 60 hours in Fargo and 100 hours down at Elbow Lake and Wapaton, those rivers are going to be wide open and moving. Okay? Well, the trouble is this is coming in Thursday evening and then it's going to slam shut Friday. So again, we're slowly working that water in, slowly working things loose, but it's not yet pushing that. So maybe by the end of this week, we'll be looking into next week and telling you when the next opening is going to occur. So I bring that up because what else influences our local flooding? It's the timing of these crests, sedimentation, slope in the rivers. These are all things that are part of our geology, engineering, and geography beside the weather issues that Bruce mentioned. And so there's in 2010, and that top curve on there is the crest coming into Fargo, but that crest is made up of those blue curves underneath there, and that's the crest on the Bois de Sioux, that's the crest on the wild rice, that's local runoff, that depending on the timing is what is going to push that crest into Fargo. So those are all the contributing factors that lead to high flow here. And of course the slope of the Red River. Which way does it flow? North. So the right hand side is the lower elevation, the left hand side is the headwaters, Wapaton and points south. And as that water comes into Fargo, it's a little faster coming down a more steep slope and then it flattens out a little bit from Fargo into Halstead and speeds up again and continues on. The same thing is happening on the slopes, on the benches, where water is coming off the benches fairly quickly, flattens out on the flats, if you will, slows down and starts to pond and pool and move its way into the river. So all of those are things that we're going to see unfold in the next two weeks. So we said March was merciless. We had nasty wet storms that came through. We <clears> set a top 10 runoff year expected here into the Red River, moderate to major flooding throughout this area. The good news this last week and weekend, still that ideal thaw has been occurring. Slow and easy it's been going. Not so good. Well, I say not so good, really we need this. We need the warming to ramp up this week. The stormy part, uh, it's not looking too stormy right now. So that's good. You've all seen these colors. 
lots of trouble out there, lots of potential runoff, a lot of water in the system waiting to come through. So, so far for Cass and Clay counties here, they're wetted down with excess rain and snow from September into October. They froze up a bit damp. So overall our form, fall moisture was high. Our stream flow right now is normal again because there's hardly anything in the streams. It's frozen up. The frost is deep, <coughs> snowpack very high, snow water very high. Spring thaw cycle running late. We're a week behind the power curve working on two weeks behind. And so our risk for rain is high. Now, the soil moisture percentages, they're going up a little bit in southeast North Dakota because we're starting to see that soil moisture work on the top layer. And so it's reaching into the 95th, 99th percentile in the far southeast part of North Dakota. So we have some moisture in that ground. But average snow stream flows as of yesterday, again, pretty much frozen up. But you can see all that blue area is where things are starting to move in, in areas where water is starting to move, and that's, that's getting into pretty close to us. Frost depths still very deep overall throughout the area, but I will point out this, and that's off the North Dakota Ag Weather Network, that's soil temperatures, and that's in that first four inches, and notice that's this morning. That's this morning. There's a lot of 31, 32 degrees sitting in that four inches below dirt. So even as the air temperature has cooled down quite dramatically this morning, the soil temperature has been rising and holding. So if it can rise and hold, and if it can thaw a little bit, can it hold a little moisture? That's always the key in there. But we had a lot of snow. We're melting that snow. If we were to look at this, which is moisture that from late February in through mid-March, we haven't gotten much since then, but that's the last week of February through the first couple of weeks of March. And we see over Fargo, that's better than two inches of rain. Over Grand Forks, more than an inch and a half, pushing toward two. And in the far south part of the basin, just, whoops, went a little far there, edging up onto three inches there at the headwaters of Lake Traverse. So that's 250% of normal precipitation down there during that time period. Not too bad, considering what was going on down in eastern South Dakota and into Omaha area, where much warmer temperatures, much more runoff. So again, we did not get that heavy rain all the way up to here. And it looks like we're not going to get it yet for another week or more. So we're not anywhere near the 97 and 2009 potential runoff, but we're two, three and a half, four inches above normal for this time of the year. Just click through there. That's what's coming up in the next seven days. Not much over us. <coughs> A few spits here on Tuesday, maybe again at the end of the week. 8 to 14 says, ah, oh, we're going to edge back into cooler than normal after April 1st, but near normal for precipitation. So that's looking good into the experimental three to four weeks, so that's through the middle of April, uh, edging to near normal, maybe even drier than normal. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that with a grain of salt. So again, all these still have to wake up and get moving. So there's Wapton Breckenridge. That's the outlook for coming in. That black line is the probabilities we've been talking about. That's all in the major risk category. That's road closures. That's that's impacting the city as you close flood walls. So that black line is the current conditions vetted against what has happened each of the last 70 years from now through April. So those are the blue dots underneath. The black is what we're poised for. And that's where we get the risk. Coming into the wild rice near Abercrombie, again, look at that high category for major flooding. So that's going to be affecting uh, southern Cass County. The questions where ag flooding, rural flooding, County Road 3 bridge flooded, when and if I-29 starts to get threatened there where it crosses with the wild rice. Coming into Fargo-Moorhead, 
toll bridge, the First Avenue bridge closed, sandbagging. What has to happen to affect those closures and, and to keep things buttoned up around town? So again, a high risk right there at 37.8.9 and about a two, two and a half foot gap up to there to flood a record. So that's crowded in that probabilistic clump right there, right between major flood stage and flood of record where most of the risk line. Oh, that's the old one. Aha, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at that going, that's an old one. All of those black lines here and the update March 15th all moved up here. So that whole clump in risk <coughs> moved up with that extra storminess in early March. Coming in on the Minnesota side into Dilworth, that doesn't look like bad news with a lot of moderate flooding coming in at Sabin on the south branch of the Buffalo, coming in Holly into Dilworth on the north branch. But that's still breakout flow, agricultural flooding, the risk of Highway 10 by Glendon getting flooded at those heights. The Cheyenne River coming in in Kindred here into Cass County again. Look at that flat lining right up there at 21 and a half feet because at that point it's breaking out all around the south end of Highway 46. <coughs> trying to move around Kindred and toward the Cheyenne Diversion. So a very high risk of that occurring. <coughs> and then at the West Fargo Diversion, that's moving in and again, topping out as diversion flow is moving around West Fargo on the west side. But what's gonna happen? It breaks out then north of that diversion channel as it spreads toward hardwood on the north side. And that starts at 21 feet, which is nearly certain. The Maple River coming in near Mapleton, moderate to major risk. Again, some of that flow being managed by the Maple River Dam, but again, the possibility for agricultural flooding, breakout flows, road closures, and all of that coming in now north of West Fargo, <coughs> combining with the Rush River here as the Cheyenne River comes in near Harwood major stage expected, it's gonna flat line there. As now the Red River is gonna hold back some of the flow that would be coming out and cause backwater there. So breakout flows act flooding water up against I-29 south of Harwood at 91 feet, water and ice against I-94 bridge north of Harwood. So, by the numbers, some of the impacts. Pop this back up there. This is for field reports. This is people can sign into cred.wq.io. You can go out there and take a picture of what's going on where you are and let us know. It posts to a web page, it posts to the, la to the location time of that occurrence, and it gives us something to reference <coughs> as this is unfolding around the neighborhoods. Any questions? <coughs> <coughs> no, thank you, Greg, for that. Uh, Near-term forecast looks favorable. That's a good sign. Um, but this year, staying with the uh, strategy that we've used since 2009, we've again planned to prepare for the 10% probability uh, at this point. Obviously, we hope that doesn't happen. But if the flood forecast drops, it's far easier to ramp down than it is to try ramp up when suddenly time is your enemy as well. So um, I get concerned <coughs> as the crest pushes deeper into April and the, uh, the likelihood of rain impacting that, which is what I think you've seen in some of our neighboring states to the south where it turned out that rain was the real wild card in, in their flood protection efforts. So that leads us to uh, emergency levy requirements. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, Nathan Boerboom with the city of Fargo and Jason Benson from Cass County to talk about that a little bit, Nathan. Sure, yeah. Um, 
First of all, I'd say similar to Cass County, the city of Fargo also has a couple public meetings scheduled. Uh, ours are scheduled for Monday and Tuesday of next week, so April 1st and 2nd. Uh, the north side meetings will be occurring at the Fargo Dome, and uh, the south side meetings will be occurring down off of 25th Street at Centennial Elementary School. Uh, both meetings will start, have an open house start at 6.30, and uh, actual presentations start at 7 o'clock. So we'd uh, ask for any of the residents that are uh, expecting to have to sandbag behind their homes or if they have any questions on what the city <coughs> is planning to do for protection to attend these meetings. We'll have all our plans there available for viewing as well as the staff that will be actually out in the field during the event available for uh, any questions. So here's this. And Nathan, on that, it's important that the neighborhood captains come to that meeting on north side, south side for all our neighborhoods, just so they know what they're, uh, what's going on in their neighborhood, what they need to do. Yep, absolutely. And then over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll also have our staff going out and talking with the neighborhoods as well. Thank you. So uh, here's a couple maps. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is how the city of Fargo approaches our flood fighting areas. We have the areas of the city broken off into uh, where we have to complete emergency measures as well as we have permanent works. So we have staff, engineers assigned to all those as well as uh, technicians. These are the guys that will be out in the field during the actual flood fight assisting as well as uh, fire department staff as well. Uh, on the right hand side is the area where or the locations we are currently planning on installing some uh, emergency measures. Uh, this is a hybrid map showing areas that we have completed works today as well as uh, planned activities. And go to the next slide. Uh, so for a 41 foot protection plan, uh, we are planning a top of levees at 43 feet. Uh, we'll be relying on a lot of existing infrastructure. Uh, you can see we have completed a lot of work uh, that uh, we will be relying to safely pass these flows through town, as well as we have unfortunately a lot of emergency measures that still need to be completed too. So we're right around 20 miles worth of emergency measures that will be getting deployed here over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, we have been working with the Corps of Engineers to uh, start construction of our temporary levees. Uh, that will probably occur here in the next 10 days or so. That start will happen as we watch the melt, as well as we're uh, gearing up for sandbagging operations and uh, looking at our critical infrastructure and where we may need to install some secondary levees. So then, uh, similar to Cass County as well, I thought I'd show up. Uh, this interactive flood stage map, it's basically the same tool between the two agencies, but uh, you can go to our website, fargond.gov backslash maps, and there'll be a link there for flood stages. Um, you can play with the various crest levels, see where the impacts would be. Uh, the map that you see up here is downtown at the 4th Street Levy. Uh, the green is actually what would be anticipated to be flooded. Uh, I have it here shown at a 41 foot crest. So with our uh, levy in place, we'd expect that not to happen, but it's a good tool for residents to look at trying to determine what elevation their homes may be uh, affected at various levels. Uh, here's just a quick snapshot of uh, us not having to complete our second street levy this spring. Uh, it's right outside the wall behind me here, uh, we have a flood wall that was constructed last year and uh, luckily we do not have to see that temporary levy getting constructed anymore. With that, yeah. Great picture, thank you Nathan. Uh, Jason Benson, Cass County. All right, thanks Bruce. So at the, in the county we've got a, a lot different flood fight in that a lot of rural areas, subdivisions and homes are up against the river and, and don't have the ability to for us to build levees uh, to protect them. So we rely a lot on sandbags. We do have uh, uh, an area south of town and uh, north of town that we can do some protection for a uh, larger number of homes. So on the south side, we really focus along the 25th Street uh, corridor from 76th Avenue down to 88th Avenue and then over to uh, Cass 81 or University Drive. And uh, so we'll and we're working uh, hand in hand with the city of Fargo engineering in tying in uh, these temporary uh, flood fighting protection levies uh, with, with, uh, with your levies as well. Uh, but uh, for the most part, you know, we're, we're looking at using uh, 
trap bags or some sort of uh, quick rapid deployable type levee system uh, that we can fill <coughs> with sand or gravel and rapidly get up. And uh, we feel pretty confident where we're at in our planning at this point uh, that we'll have those materials and contracts in place. Up on the north end, uh, our focus is in the uh, Stockman subdivision and Highland Park area where there's a couple low spots uh, that we would also use those rapid deployable type uh, flood levy barriers uh, to, to get out on the, the, the higher uh, 41 level type floods. Thank you, Jason. And that, uh, that brings us to uh, sandbag production. And uh, in Fargo, we've set an initial sandbag production goal of a million sandbags. That means roughly two weeks of uh, sandbag production at Sandbag Central. Uh, the difficult thing about sandbags as a means of emergency flood protection is the level of volunteer participation that's needed. Uh, not only to produce sandbags, but then later on to place the sandbags out in the field where, where they're needed. So volunteer coordination is critical uh, to a successful sandbagging effort. Both the city of Fargo and Cass County are gearing up for sandbag operations and will rely on volunteer participation in a very big way. So again, I'd like to call on Terry Ludlam on behalf of the city of Fargo and then Jason, I'll kick it back to you at the county as well to talk about that a little bit. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, maybe for the benefit of the folks that weren't in the area uh, since the 2013 flood, Sandbag Central in Fargo is located at 2301 8th Avenue North. Um, and as Bruce mentioned, our goal this year is 1 million sandbags. Uh, staff has been working over last week and today to procure the equipment and set up all the equipment, go through some calibration today yet, and we will be uh, operational then tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Uh, we feel in order to meet that goal of a million sandbags, we'll be operational through the balance of this week, so March 26th to the 29th, and then all of next week, April 1st through April 5th. Um, the way our operations are set up and designed this year, we'd like to have about 200 volunteers there at all times, and I think Nicole will be visiting a little bit uh, in a little bit here about uh, the opportunities and how to sign up for all that. Um, all the sandbags that are produced out of Sandbag Central will be put into storage in uh, various city facilities. And later this week, then, we'll be discussing deployment of those filled sandbags. Thank you. Jason. All right. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so we're <coughs> also gearing up our operations right now. Uh, our goal is 300,000 sandbags and uh, we're gonna conduct our sandbag volunteer operations starting Wednesday uh, through uh, Friday, the 5th of April. And uh, Monday through Friday will be open from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. and then Saturday from 8 to 7 and Sunday from 12 noon to 7 p.m. Again, uh, we need those volunteer, uh, you know, whether it's you know, groups, organizations and members from the rural subdivisions and, and rural areas to come in and support that. Um, we also will uh, have empty sandbags available for resident, rural residents to get. That'll also be at the Cass County Highway Department. Uh, both our sandbag uh, filling operation will be at the Cass County Highway Department on Main Avenue in West Fargo, out by the, the fairgrounds in Bonanzaville. And, uh, and then uh, residents can come out, pick up, bundles of a thousand sandbags uh, we charge a hundred dollars for that bundle and then the county will coordinate to have a load of sand delivered to their rural residents uh, uh, with that bundle so it's a it's a good uh, good way for them to get the sand and have the right materials that they need to to uh, to fill those sandbags and get their uh, the flood fighting preps ready to go uh, when it comes to the fill sandbags we have our prioritization there where uh, the first priority is really to get sandbags into the areas that are behind those levees that I showed earlier, um, where those residents will be cut off during uh, once we get those levees up and, and installed. Uh, then the next priority will be residents that come in and volunteer. We will attempt to get a thousand filled sandbags out to their residents as as a start to uh, um, to add to their uh, along with any any of the empty sandbags that they need to buy. And then from there, we will also have sandbags to deploy for emergency purposes. 
Thank you, Jason. Um, so both the city of Fargo and Cass County obviously will be uh, uh, relying on volunteer participation, which uh, um, is not a simple thing to coordinate. Uh, in Fargo, Nicole Crutchfield is uh, leading our logistics operations, which uh, you may not know it, but that's a really big lift because in addition to volunteer coordination, it involves transportation coordination, supporting services coordination, materials and supplies coordination, a lot of moving parts there. But I'd like to call on Nicole to talk a little bit about the volunteer coordination piece anyway, and then maybe ask Robert to do the same thing on behalf of the county, Nicole. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bruce. And um, uh, everybody can be rest assured I'm not doing this by myself. There's a large team of people. And um, primarily, we're very dependent on First Link, and we uh, thank First Link uh, for manning a call center for us. And as such, we are kind of in charge of a call center directory, if you will. And so these are the numbers we're using right now for um, anybody that wants to call our hotline at 476-4000, and we can get you to the right place uh, as part of those, uh, those calls or questions. Um, but uh, primarily, um, we're also very thankful for the Salvation Army and the Red Cross for helping support um, food and some logistics for the uh, volunteers as well. In terms of um, what we need, as Terry mentioned, we need um, 200 people um, at any, any given moment to run both of our uh, uh, spiders. And so um, thanks to the Fargo School District and West Fargo School District, they can um, get us to that about 60% registered and um, any large group that wants to, uh, any member more than um, 20 people or so, if they want to call uh, our main number at 476-4000. Uh, and I think there's another slide um, if they want to um, uh, kind of move forward. So at St. Beck Central, um, as Terry mentioned, we're at 2301 8th Avenue North. You can just show up there. Um, people think they need a pre-register, but actually you can just show up anytime between um, uh, seven and seven. If you have a large group, again, you can um, register in advance to find out if we need that many people at that time. But there's also a website where you can go online and see. We kind of keep it red, yellow, and green, or red, yellow, and blue to determine if we're full at capacity. But rest assured, right now, we're not anywhere near full in any of the um, days, Monday through Friday. Um, we will have a map bus shuttle. If you just park on the street, we're trying to keep 8th Avenue north clear for semis, et cetera. Um, but uh, if you park anywhere else around the um, block, the shuttle will be just circulating and can pick you up and bring you to the, right to the front doors. So um, again, um, starting tomorrow, we don't have anybody registered for that 8 a.m. hour, um, but um, from 9 to 1, we're very dependent on the schools, uh, getting us to a little over halfway in terms of the um, number of people we need um, filling sandbags. And um, we are also calling, if you're part of a group that's been volunteering in the past, we're actually calling you. And so um, Catlin in our office might be reaching out to you um, to see if you're interested in signing up. Again, you can also just show up. And um, our most need is at that 8 a.m. hour and then at 2 to 7 p.m. once um, the school kids go back home. So <coughs> yeah, any questions or? No, thank you, Nicole. Uh, Robert Wilson, uh, Cass County, <laughs> volunteer coordination, how's it going? Bruce, thank you very much. And uh, a similar message, we need volunteers. Uh, we uh, are operational this Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, and we'll go through Friday, uh, April 5th. We are breaking our weekday shifts up into three sections. We're going to go uh, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., 2 p.m. to 5.30, and 5.30 to 8 p.m., and then on Saturday, uh, we'll go 8 a.m. to noon and noon to 4, and Sunday, <laughs> noon to 4 and 4 to 8 p.m. And uh, again, we can't stress it enough that we do need, we do need volunteers. Uh, we've got the, the information on our website. Uh, if you're interested in going to uh, find information about how to, how to sign up, obviously our uh, flood information number, 2418000. And, uh, and we, we need about 60 people per shift to, uh, to meet our goal. And, uh, uh, we really are uh, looking to the community to help get the word out because we, uh, we realize we're not the biggest game in town as far as a sandbag operation. And, and we do need 
60 people at every shift to make our, uh, uh, to make our goal. And, and you heard earlier from the weather uh, and the flood forecasts that uh, some of these, uh, these outlying uh, rivers, uh, other than the red, are, it, it looks like it's top line all the way across. And so that, that means Argusville, Harwood, many of our rural communities are going to be getting hit especially hard. And uh, we just, again, we need the community to realize there are two sandbag operations going and we're, we're doing well uh, so far as the number of, of uh, groups and people who have started to, to sign up and respond so far, but, but we're not there yet. And we need, uh, we need those, uh, those calls and those groups to, uh, to keep coming. And uh, please, if you have questions, if you, if you need any more information, get a hold of us. And uh, I, again, we're, we're uh, trying not to be repetitive, but beating that drum, watching local news coverage this morning uh, as I was getting ready, there was information about uh, Sandbag Central and, and we just need to do, uh, make sure we hit that message really hard. There are two sandbag operations going for this flood effort. Thank you, Robert. And the important thing about the difference between the county and the city effort is the county is actually gonna go through the weekend. Yes, we Since are. the Bison aren't in the basketball playoffs, you should have no reason not to come out and help you guys. We've, we've got two, two shifts, both Saturday and Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a former enterprise director, I spent a good portion of my career working on the utility side of city operations. Uh, so I continue to have a great interest in those things. Um, in addition to issues on the street, which we can all see, we also have three critical utilities underground that you can't see, and those include the uh, storm sewer, sanitary sewer, and water systems. And so I would like to call briefly on, on our three directors that deal with those things just to get some, uh, uh, some early on comments, starting with Bandau, our public works director to talk about the street condition and that storm sewer system that's interesting as the river rises, we have a lot of pumping to do. Uh, that is correct, Bruce, and thank you. Um, you know, this we were, are gonna jump into action this week. Um, as that river uh, moves over that 16 foot mark, that starts our, <coughs> our gate closure. And as we move up to about the 27 foot mark, that's when we're gonna see we're 100% uh, dependent on pumping within the city of Fargo. Um, our potential for free flowing to the river is then gone. So uh, there could be um, some negative impacts that take place if we do experience a significant rain event. Um, we've had some good uh, freeze thaw days here. Um, we've, we've relieved a lot of our issues within the city of our, our catch basins being frozen up. Um, so if we can get a few nice days this week and uh, hold off on having to close those gates, that would help a lot to get rid of as much moisture as we can within the city and then shut down and uh, move forward with our pumping plan. Um, pumps, uh, large scale pumps will begin delivering <coughs> April 1st and then our crews will be setting those as needed as throughout the city. Thank you, Ben. And then I see our, uh, our wastewater utility director and water utility director are teed up. Uh, the sanitary sewer system, every time it floods and it rains and there's any level of street flooding, there's always uh, a concern about the sanitary sewer system. Uh, Jim Haasauer has got some good news to share. We've made uh, uh, a lot of capacity improvements on that system since our last flood. So Jim, uh, can you tell us about that? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, I just want to touch base on some of the, the great improvements we, we made with our sanitary sewer system since 2009. For example, um, we've increased our peak pumping capacity, our headworks. Originally in 2009, it was 20 million gallons per day. We are now upwards of 28 million gallons per day. Um, also in 2009, we had three large sanitary sewer collector interceptors that would all have to go through the wastewater plant all, all at one time, essentially creating a, a hydraulic uh, bottleneck there. We are now able to independently divert each one of those interceptors off to the lagoons, thus relieving the pressure of the, on, the, on the collection system as well as the wastewater plant. Plus, we can actually isolate the wastewater plant to where only 5% of the flows would actually go through there. We can send them all up to the lagoons during a wet weather event. Um, our average daily flow through the wastewater plant is about 11 to 12 million gallons per day. We're seeing over the last few days with the snow melt and that type of thing that it's, it's crowding 15 to 18, sometimes 20 million gallons per day. 
So it's just kind of a reminder of those people who have those uh, seasonal waivers for the sump pumps, it's probably a good idea to get those out um, by April 1st to kind of reduce the amount of water that we have in our sanitary sewer system. So with that, any questions? If not, I'll turn it over to Troy. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Troy uh, just completed a uh, water treatment plant expansion, I know, but uh, uh, other good things on the water side. Uh, yeah, um, from a flood preparation standpoint, um, we, after the 2009 uh, flood, we had a kind of a piece by piece, step by step plan for protecting the water plant and water plant campus. That's the most uh, vulnerable probably part of our system with the, with the flooding. So um, right now we're partner, partnering with, uh, with Public Works and Ben and engineering with Nate and then Jim and Wastewater to try and uh, just update our plan and make it current to include our, uh, our water membrane water treatment plant and just make sure we have all the pumps and equipment in place to, to do it. So that's, that's really what we're uh, working on uh, right now. Uh, as far as the water plant goes, the, the main floor is, is pretty high. The, probably the most, uh, most concerning facility is the Red River pump station. So we'll be doing some work on that pump station uh, as well to get ready for it. So, and then since 2009, we've made several improvements to the place from a flood protection standpoint. So, but getting to your, uh, getting to your uh, point about the membrane water treatment plant, um, Greg, Greg Gus mentioned in his presentation earlier that uh, our, our water uh, coming into the Red River is, is really from Orwell out of Fergus Falls and then Lake Travers, uh, that which they, they began releasing in early March. Uh, that water is, is really uh, hard and uh, hard water and high in dissolved solids too in addition to the extra water. So, uh, right now, we do have our membrane plant uh, reverse osmosis system in operation. So as of uh, this morning, it was just under 30% of the water is coming out of that plant to help curb the dissolved solids in the water. And then um, as, as we, we kind of know the, the chemistry of the Traverse and Orwell, but it also the water quality can also change uh, with runoff and so forth. And we do... Uh, as, as opposed to 2009 and even a year ago, we do have a, um, a number of different uh, instrumentation features that, that kind of tell us what we're getting at any one time to help us with our treatment process. So um, I, I feel pretty good about where we're at, both from a flood protection standpoint <coughs> and, uh, and a water quality standpoint. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, I just wanted to, to touch on those unseen utilities that are really important in a flood fight. So. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. You'd like to recognize some of our partner agencies that will be involved? Throughout the flood fight, we're always uh, very dependent upon our volunteers, and one of the biggest volunteers are public schools. Uh, Rep. Gandhi, if you want to speak to what the Fargo schools are doing, and Beth Sletty, if you'd like to talk about what West Fargo is doing for us, you have already stepped up and made, uh, made a big impact on this. Sure. <clears throat> so Fargo Public Schools uh, will be helping with uh, two groups of students. So with uh, fulfilling the sandbags will be um, our eighth grade students based on a permission basis will be volunteering throughout the week to help fill sandbags. And then as we go to the next couple of weeks of laying the sandbags, that's when we'll be offering some support from our high school students as well. So we're here to help in any way we can, but we look forward to the opportunity. We know our students appreciate it. It's a good um, lesson in civics and just community service for them as well. My son is a sophomore at Davies, and he's wondering if he could reach down to the sophomore class, because he really liked to sandbag. But. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce Heather Lease. She's our safety coordinator and also our communications coordinator. You raise your hand, Heather. She's going to be the point of contact for the district in coordinating the efforts and the volunteers. She's also working with Fargo schools um, to make sure that we're not sending too many students one day and not enough other days. So. Again, we'll be um, volunteering with eighth graders uh, for the next few weeks. And then as the need progresses in the community um, and out at the sites, we would be looking to our um, high school students to assist with that. And again, we're in the process of gathering permission slips because not all students will be able to participate. But I wanted to let you know that in West Fargo schools, one of our key indicators is 
supporting our community. And we do measure that and value that. So this is a really great opportunity for our students to step up and to support the community. And we welcome any opportunity to help in any way that we can. And um, we have facilities as well. So uh, again, Heather Lees will coordinate those efforts. And thank you. Thank you. Craig Whitney, the chamber has always been a good partner of us in flood fights. I want to tell you we have no intent of shutting down businesses. So hopefully since they're not shut down, we can have more volunteers. But I let you speak to that. <laughs> That's for sure. First Mayor, I wanted to start by mentioning, as you know, that the chamber has been very involved in the public policy side, the legislative side of for about the last nine years. And we recognize that we're doing that already this year. But uh, particularly with the increased funding, we're going to continue to work with our businesses and our members to make sure that we work hard in Bismarck until the session is over. As far as uh, flood fighting, uh, I think it was in 2013, we uh, were asked by the city to help. And what we did that year and what we're doing this year is uh, reaching out to our members, particularly some of our larger uh, members, and encouraging them to allow their employees to volunteer during the business day, which as I think has been pointed out, is the hardest time to, uh, outside of the students, to get people there. Uh, we were very successful in doing that uh, the last time and have every reason to believe we will this year. We have already reached out in several uh, different corresponding uh, efforts with our members. Last week, we'll continue to do that. And then we have a staff person, Julie Yorchek, who's in the back there. Julie, if you can raise your hand, who uh, as she did uh, back in uh, 2013. She will be uh, the point person. Our members have, have I said, as I said, received correspondence. They can call Julie at 218-233-1100 or register on our website. And uh, so we're gonna make every effort we can to uh, you know, continue to let businesses know how important this is. Uh, because of, just like you, we obviously don't wanna see uh, businesses closed down. Thank you. Dean Bershani, a lot of things are going up on NDSU. We've made some changes since flood fights in 2013. I believe we have more student involvement and in more uh, different ways to approach the flood at the present time. Uh, and we're going to depend a lot on the students to help us out. I know a football team is starting with spring practice. Maybe they could come over and get a few. Uh, that would help out, right, Dave, if they were left in sandbags. But I'd let you speak to what this school is going to do for us. Yeah, we, um, through the unfortunate history we've had, uh, we have developed a fairly sophisticated program uh, coordinated through a crisis management response team, which is led by the Director of Public Safety, Mike War, uh, who's behind me here. Uh, that, uh, that center has already been open. We've had two communications to the campus community encouraging volunteerism. Uh, Mike and the representatives on the CMRT uh, are both the right individuals and the people that will have the authority up to and including closing NDSU if we get to that level of emergency. Uh, but we'll become more and more aggressive as far as encouraging volunteerism, coordinating that, coordinating transportation down to Sandbank Central. And uh, I, I think you're going to see a, an enthusiastic participation level from NDSU. Uh, I can almost guarantee the football team, <laughs> to the uh, men's and women's track teams, uh, our student athletes have been. Uh, real leaders in the volunteer efforts of the past. I know Joel want to get the wrestling team out there as well, I hope. <laughs> Joel, your, your organization oftentimes supports us in these efforts with equipment, help, and different things that we need. Uh, you're standing ready. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, one, to, uh, as, as much as I love to see you, Mayor, I, I have nightmares about seeing your vest. <laughs> uh, make sure we uh, limit that. But no, we appreciate uh, the efforts by the city and county leaders to make sure that we are ready for this flood fight. And that's uh, something that often goes uh, unsaid, uh, that oftentimes we get, uh, there's a lot of critical uh, people out there stating that, you know, we're starting too early, we're doing these sorts of things, but it's the foresight site that uh, you have to make sure that we get ready for any potential problems that we have. So thank you. Uh, as far as from our standpoint at the park district, again, we stand ready to make sure that we do all we can to assist the city, uh, county, uh, in any way we can through our equipment, through our manpower. Uh, we certainly have some vulnerable areas uh, to flooding within our inventory of land and, and some of those are, are very low and we know that and we have other areas that uh, we've improved over the last 10 years that we feel we have a better opportunity to, 
to fight uh, the waters back, and so we'll continue to find ways to do that. We'll have a little smaller operation if we need to get to the point where we have to build sandbags. Our staff will create about 75,000 uh, for our particular areas around our community. Uh, we feel that that would be adequate for the things that we need, but we also uh, will provide manpower to assist uh, the city in, in, in building uh, sandbags for Sandbag Central. So. Again, we stand ready to assist you in any way we can. We appreciate that. I do want to introduce one individual, Dave Beats. You want to give a wave? He's back over in this corner, I believe. He'll be uh, managing our operations from uh, logistic. He's our director of operations, and uh, we'll be ready to take any phone calls. Also, I do want to take and thank the city staff. Uh, the collaboration that we have with you uh, each and every day is incredible, and we take that to the next level, and that includes the county. Uh, when we have these types of events, we know we can count on each other to get the job done. So thank you. And Major General Alan Dorman, you have a lot of big equipment sometimes we need. We have what we call a slow response, no offense, but sometimes in a flood fight we have to have big equipment come down and help us with a dike or a breach or something that's going on. You stand ready and can activate and help us in those areas and as well as traffic if we need traffic control, is that correct? Yep, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, thanks uh, for the invite. I know I asked first, but I appreciate the invite. <laughs> um, and I do have uh, some teammates here. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jody Abel will be the Army lead. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Albright, uh, the Air lead. Cody Schultz is back here, my Deputy and Director of Homeland Security. And then, of course, Darren Anderson, uh, the Wing Commander here in Fargo. Uh, we know that Fargo and Cass County know how to fight floods, uh, but we are we also know that flood fighting is a team sport, and if we need to join that team, we want to be ready. I was mentioned that, oh, maybe we're starting too early. Um, I don't think you can start too early. It's already in the news. I don't think it's any secret that there's water coming toward the Red River. Uh, we, last week, or it was probably two weeks ago, uh, we brought the first uh, unified command together. It's, it's informal at this point. Uh, but we think it's important that we get everybody in the room on the state side and start talking. It's not a waste of time because uh, while you guys have a great plan, you have a lot of resources here. Uh, I still remember 2011 where we thought we had it licked in Minot and then there were seven inches of rain um, upstream. Uh, so you never know when it's time for us to come in. Uh, so we just want to make sure we're in the loop on what's going on here. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, but if we're going to help in a timely manner, we got to make sure the comms are good um, and that the team is here ready to, uh, to move out. Every year, uh, we pre-position equipment both on the National Guard side and on the Emergency Services side. Uh, so that equipment is here in Fargo already. Based on the intel, we'll start moving other stuff around. Uh, we'll stay in close coordination with emergency managers on both Fargo and Cass County. Uh, we have resource handbooks. Uh, that outlined everything that the Division of Emergency Services or the Department of Emergency Services and the National Guard can bring to the fight if needed. Um, so we're, we're really just here to listen, learn. I wanted to be here to get on the ground because you have to see it and you got to hear from the locals to really appreciate uh, and hopefully get ahead of any requirements. Uh, our next step is uh, the Unified Command is going to meet again on Wednesday. Uh, obviously, we'll get that or that information out if any jurisdictions want to call in and hear what's going on, on the state side. Uh, but again, we're not here to get into your business, uh, but we want to be ready uh, when you need us. Uh, the guard motto is always ready, always there, but it takes a little while to get guys off out of their civilian jobs and into their equipment and on site. Uh, so we got to be a day or two ahead of the requirement, and we can only do that if we have good communications with. Uh, Fargo and Cass County, so that's why we're here today. And again, uh, Mayor, appreciate the invite. Uh, and my team will be here anytime you have a meeting just to make sure we're getting the same information you're getting. Very much appreciate it. And if Greg Gust's uh, chart starts climbing faster and faster, we'll know we'll need you right away. So I have a lot of relatives here, so, you know. <laughs> okay. they well, one's in the back of the room. Uh, they expect me to, uh, to be here when needed. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pepcorn and Commissioner Strand, you want to make any closing comments? Uh, no, Mayor, except that, uh, you know, we, we really have a lot to be proud of in our community. And, and this is the time where we really define ourselves so well when we're facing challenges uh, as a group. And uh, there aren't enough thanks for everybody and all the people in the schools and the entities that are supporting this. So um, you're doing great work, and it's greatly appreciated. 
Thank you. Our next meeting will be Monday, April 1st, at 8 a.m., same chambers. Uh, we will turn, push that uh, into this week only if we have a major rain event or a major weather event that makes us want to go faster. The idea of these meetings will be they'll be more frequent as we get closer to the crest. And I did say we can't be complacent. We really can't. A lot of times early in the flood like this, somebody says, oh, Tim, it's only going to go to 35. And I can remember Denny and I when we talked about that, and he took his famous trips down south. I did take a trip down south over the weekend, and there's a lot of snowpack out there that has to melt, and it's not starting to move yet. So we will all know more next week, and as we get closer and closer to crest time, we will have the meetings more often. But I want to thank everybody for standing up right away, volunteering, and coming to the aid of this flood fight. And Mary, I'll call you right back. And uh, appreciate that, uh, all the work you all do. Uh, Mary Shirley. Thank you. I, I just, thanks everyone for being here, but I just have one more big, big ask. Uh, as chair of the Metro Area Flood Diversion Project, uh, timing is crucial right now. North Dakota legislature's in session. Everybody listening, please contact North Dakota legislators and ask them to support this project financially. Thanks. Very, very important point. We're in a big session this week going over the fund, funding for this project, and we do need everybody's help on that. Bruce, anything else? There's a press conference in 10 minutes, just in case the press has some specific questions, and we'll hold it over at the podium next to us. But. Just would like to, uh, uh, again, thank everybody for coming and um, um, look forward to winning another one. Thank you. Karen? Yeah. Oh, I'll probably be there today.